Great. Thanks so much, Alexis, for the uh, introduction. So uh, actually, in fact, the, my talk today will actually be a little bit different than the rest of the talks because the majority of my PhD has focused on actually the interface between high performance computing on one hand and actually quantum computing on the other hand. So despite the slightly daunting title, actually, the subtext is actually a very, very simple and elegant question, which is simply, what are quantum computers actually useful for and what are they good for? And to answer this question, in fact, it's actually very, very illustrative to go back a little bit to yesterday's very beautiful and inspiring talk by Professor Boot. What Professor Boot mentioned was that we really live in a very, very special time period. And this is a period which he, in some sense, called the age of enablement, where in some sense, a high school student, as he says, can take $9,000 of his hard-earned mowing the long money and can actually be able to buy a mouse line to be able to test a particular hypothesis. But of course, the age of enablement actually goes beyond just these naive mouse lines, which are very interesting, of course. But it's actually, we live in a generation where this is the first time that you can also go online and buy a quantum computer. So I'm sure the majority of you have heard of this company called D-Wave. D-Wave is uh, a commercial company that purports to sell the world's very, very first quantum computer. And in fact, as you can see, there's the ubiquitous at the bottom right-hand corner of their website, Add to Cart button. One has to be a little bit careful when you press this Add to Cart button. You might have to check your credit card because as far as Google and Lockheed Martin are concerned, they were the first ones to purchase this machine called the D-Wave 1. It costs $10 million, slightly more than $9,000 for a mouse line. But the question one can ask about quantum computing is a, is a very interesting one and is exceptionally well related to computational science. It's that if you had an intrepid teenager or a high schooler who had a quantum computer, could they, for example, solve frontier molecular orbital theory better than all of us? Could they solve Navier-Stokes equations better than all of us? And what is the exact interface between computational science as we know it and quantum computing as is being enabled by current technologies? And what I hope to convince you of is that there really is a very, very interesting synergy between these three aspects. And what we've heard about some very, very beautiful talks in the last few days is really about starting with the computational science aspect and trying to understand sort of certain properties about nature. And in fact, also utilizing the properties of nature to feed back on computational techniques to be able to better utilize them. What I hope to tell you about is a third facet of this newly developed technology, which is quantum computation. And I hope to explain to you that the relationship between what is computational science as, as we know it, and also quantum computation, and how we can use quantum computation to both feed back on computational science and better understand nature. To be able to understand this relationship, it's actually extremely important to understand a little bit about complexity theory. So in some sense, we've heard a, a ton of stories about how computational techniques can solve very, very interesting problems. But in some sense, the other side of the same coin is actually complexity theory. So while computational techniques allow one to actually you know, find interesting results about you know, ice sheets and many other topics, complexity is sort of you know, the you know, little brother that's able to tell you when you can tell your advisor, no, I gave up on the problem. It's sort of telling you the sense that, you know, what are easy problems, what are hard problems, when are problems scalable, and when are problems not scalable? And in essence, the very simple question that quantum complexity or complexity theory in general asks is how does a particular problem scale with size? So if you imagine adding two single digit numbers, that takes a particular computing resource. And we can also ask, what is the same, what is the amount of resource that it takes to now add two n digit numbers? So if you double the size of the problem, does it in fact just take double the computing resources, or in a worst case scenario, does it actually take exponential in the size that you've actually increased? In which case, it would become a very, very intractable problem. We'd only really be able to solve the very, very smallest instances, and scanning to a bigger network or understanding properties of a larger network would become much, much more difficult. And so, to really sort of formally define complexity theory, I just want you to remember four very, very simple acronyms, which most of you have already heard. The first acronym is a class of problems called P. And P stands for polynomial, and it's the class of problems that can be solved in what people call polynomial time on a classical computer, on your laptop, per se. And what this means is polynomial is in the size of the problem. So if you go from one-digit numbers to n-digit numbers, the statement is that, Problems are thought to be easy, or in this class P, 
if the amount of resources only scales in some polynomial power of this particular change in size. So if you double, for example, the size of the problem, perhaps it takes double the amount of resources to be able to actually solve it, or maybe you know, even n squared in some sense. And that's sort of the general notion of problems which I want you to keep in your mind as being extremely easy. There is exactly sort of you know, the corresponding class of quantum problems, which are called in a class BQP, standing for bounded quantum polynomial. And it's the class of problems that we can actually solve efficiently or easily in polynomial time on a quantum computer. And you're actually very familiar with lots and lots of problems in both of these classes. So some of the problems are in the class P are the ones that you utilize every day, basically. They're sort of you know, arithmetic, basic addition, subtraction, sorting lists. These are all things that your computer can, in principle, do efficiently. On the other hand, in the quantum case, actually, there was a, a very beautiful and seminal result by Peter Shore from MIT in 1994, where he actually showed that prime factorization, taking integer and finding its primes, can actually be done in polynomial time on a quantum computer. He proposed a particular quantum algorithm to do this. Now, this is you know, already extremely interesting because as most of you well know, there does not exist anything that, uh, there does not exist a classical algorithm to be able to factor integers on a classical computer. And this is in fact, this difference, the fact that you know, on any classical computer, the best known algorithm scales exponentially in the size of the problem, that's exactly the reason why when you do a credit card transaction, most of the time it's actually secure. It's protected by this notion of RSA encryption, which is exactly the idea that if I take two big prime numbers and I multiply them together, multiplication is a very, very easy thing, so I can just make the lengths of the numbers very large. But factorizing the resulting number classically is extremely difficult. So we're already seeing that there's a difference between sort of the power of a quantum computer and the power of a classical computer. It can solve this particular factoring problem which as of right now, we have no known idea for how to do on a classical computer, but we know that there exists a quantum algorithm. So these are easy problems in the classical and the quantum case. Of course, then there are also correspondingly hard problems. The correspondingly hard problems in the classical case are in a class called NP, standing for a non-deterministic polynomial. And these are the problems that have solutions which you can verify that it is the correct solution in polynomial time on a computer. But if you were to search for it yourself and try to find the solution, you would not be able to do better than exponential in sort of the size of the problem. And these are sort of very, very standard problems that we also know. The classic one is the traveling salesman problem, which asks the question if you have a vendor that needs to go to n cities, and there are different paths connecting these n cities, what's the shortest path that he can traverse such that he visits all the cities exactly once? It's a classic problem in this sort of you know, class called NP. Correspondingly, exactly sort of to this NP question, is the class that's called QMA. And that actually stands for a very interesting story. It's called Quantum Merlin Arthur. And if you ask me afterwards, I'll tell you the little story that goes along with that. But that actually is uh, the class of problems that can be checkable in polynomial time on a quantum computer. But it actually cannot, the problems cannot be solved, or at least we don't know solutions for these problems in polynomial time. Only their answers can be verified. So what is the meaning that there exists a notion of hard and easy problems? Well, it's a question that if you can answer, the Clay Math Institute will give you a million dollars. So it's a question and a conjecture that P does not equal NP. It says that the class, at least in classical computing, it says that the class of things that we can solve efficiently in polynomial time is sort of uh, within a larger class of problems which we may not be able to have efficient polytime solutions for that those in the class NP, in some sense, are always going to be exponentially more difficult. And this, as I said, is a particular conjecture, but it's basically widely believed by almost every computer scientist in the world. So the question of what a quantum computer can do boils down to where exactly on this particular graph do the classes BQP and QMA actually solve? Can a quantum computer, which we know can factor, which we know looks like to be a problem in NP, can it solve all of the difficult problems, meaning they can solve all of these traveling salesman problems, solve equations that we couldn't solve previously, or is there actually sort of a, an intermediate overlap regime? And luckily for us, it's the second answer. What's largely believed to be the picture when you put in BQP and QMA is a picture that looks like this, which is the statement that although 
this quantum computer in polynomial time can solve certain problems that are in NP. The vast majority of problems in NP, in particular the class of problems that are known as NP complete, the hardest problems in NP, can actually not be solved by this particular quantum computer. So that starts to beg the question, if you were able to, you know, take $10 million and buy a D-Wave quantum computer, what could you actually do with it? It doesn't look like you can solve the most general class of classical problems that are very difficult. Instead, my research in the last few years has been focused on understanding what they can do as quantum simulators. And what I hope to convince you is, in fact, that although a quantum computer can't necessarily solve all of the hardest classical problems, it's extremely, extremely efficient at simulating other quantum systems. In some sense, you have bits in a classical computer, and you have quantum bits in a quantum computer. And these quantum bits can mimic lots and lots of other quantum systems and be able to tell you information about those quantum systems, a particular feat which is difficult for a classical computer. The particular example I'd like to share with you today is actually uh, a very, very simple and elegant effect, which is called the fractional quantum Hall effect. This is actually the, uh, has produced quite a number of Nobel Prizes through the years, and it actually is a super simple effect that requires only three ingredients. It requires electrons which live in a two-dimensional plane. You apply a very, very strong magnetic field which makes the electrons orbit around the magnetic field, and you go to low temperatures. And these experiments have, in fact, been done. This is the, exactly what the Nobel Prizes were awarded for. And you realize a particular new state of matter when you realize these three conditions called a fractional quantum Hall state of matter. And the state of matter actually goes against much of the intuition that you've heard about your entire life, especially in understanding what the word fractional comes from. In some sense, if we imagine a very, very simple Gadonkin experiment in our head, if we take a single electron and we put it into a piece of metal, just an additional electron. The electron sort of lives with the other electrons. It interacts with Coulomb interactions, as we heard about a lot this morning. And solving that problem is extremely difficult, but you know, it's a question of electrons. In this particular quantum Hall fluid, this new state of matter, you can do the same experiment. Imagine taking a particular tip, tunneling a single electron into this particular quantum Hall fluid. The amazing property is now the electron actually fractionalizes. It, in fact, in the simplest case, becomes three independent quasi-particles. And these particles can move by themselves. And in fact, each of the particles carries charge E over three. So we've heard about the electron being fundamentally elementary. But in fact, there are quantum materials out there where the excitations within these materials actually carry charge that's a fraction of the original electronic charge. Understanding the dynamics of these particular fractional excitations is, of course, of extreme interest, and it's very difficult to probe experimentally. And that's what sort of my study of quantum computers as quantum simulators has brought us to. So the idea that I've recently proposed with my advisor and collaborators is the possibility of using actual molecules, polar molecules, which are much larger than electrons, much easier to utilize in experiments. In particular, we're thinking about a molecule called potassium rubidium. These molecules don't behave like electrons naively. They interact with each other, but not via Coulomb interactions, instead via dipolar interactions. And the question and the statement is that with sort of techniques and with the ability of a quantum computer, one can actually make these particular molecules behave very similar to electrons or effectively look like electrons in a, in a, in a, in a dynamic sense. And with that, one can actually sort of, you know, control these particular molecules by using optical radiation, by using laser fields. We can control their interaction strength by using electric fields. And at the end of the day, we can actually realize a situation that's very similar to electronic structure calculations that people are doing in the audience, which is that instead of looking at the band structure that electrons live in now for a particular material, we can actually ask what is the particular band structure, what is the particular kinetic environment that these molecules live in? And one can perform very, very simple diagonalization and realize a particular band structure looking like this. One can populate this band structure with particles. And then one can perform exact diagonalization to ask what exactly is the nature of the particular quantum state that emerges when we think about using a quantum computer of molecules to simulate this very interesting physical effect that we've seen in nature. And the answer is that there's extremely strong numerical evidence that fractionalization actually does exist. This is the reason why there looks like there are two exact ground states. And by studying this sort of, you know, both numerically and also once we do have a quantum computer that can realize this type of a situation, 
one can actually realize that there are extremely interesting phase transitions. In the same way that there's phase transitions from water to sort of ice, there are phase transitions from these fractional churn insulator states, or fractional quantum Hall states, to other states which look like solids, which look like superfluids. And given these types of uh, transitions, it'd be extremely interesting to probe these in a quantum computing setting, and also sort of numerically, given the ability to utilize these molecules as effective simulators of the dynamics of these real materials. With that, I'd like to thank uh, a number of really fantastic collaborators and my advisor, Misha Lukin. And of course, I, I'd like to thank especially the CSGF for support. Thank you very much.